Great. Okay. Um, nice to have you all here. Um, as um, Lucas already mentioned, I'm Nico. I'm working here at Innovex as um, big data scientist, and um, I had the time in the last uh, the last time um, to um, get to know Docker and Kubernetes, and so I want to try how I can put Flink in a in a container. Um, and I would be really interested. Who of you already knows containers, or especially like Docker, which is kind of the same at this time? Okay, like, and y who is of you feels like confident, like writing a Docker file? Okay, that's actually great. So we we can make that's pretty short. Okay, um, I promised you um, some some capirinha, and sadly this wasn't about our drinking offer. Um, it was like a comparison. Just assume for the beginning, um, a Kyberinia would be the same as, as Flink. So what do we need for a Kyberinia or for Flink? Um, we need different ingredients. Um, so like Flink as uh, um, a Kyberinia, such as almost every cocktail is based on, on, on ice. So most containers also are based on Linux. This is s the basis of, of the most um, Docker containers. Then we have something which is also like popular in drinks um, or like in Docker containers, um, which is maybe not that nice alone, but in a good drink, it's pretty pretty good. That's lemons or maybe Java, something like that. Then we have some some special ingredients which are rare but um, yeah used for f for Flink, for example, which is like brown sugar or Acker, which is um, a framework used under the hood. And then of course there's the alcohol, the special one, um, the Flink binaries. So we have all this together, and now um, we have a great Caperinia, don't we? We just throw it together, and yeah, what we get actually isn't that nice. It's it's just a mess. You wouldn't want want to drink it. You actually you really couldn't. So we need something to get it all together to be able to carry it around to drink it, um, and this is our container. So a glass in this case seems to be something kind of similar to, to a container. It's there for uh, creating isolation. It's there to um, having it packaged and so that you can more easily distribute it, give it to a friend, take it with you, something like that. And um, such as a glass can not only be used for Cabernet, actually it can be used for a lot of different drinks. So um, containers can also be used for a lot of different technologies. Um, in the beginning, it was like containers are more used for like easy stuff, like stateless, like a web server, which is just distributing files to, to, to clients. But actually, these days, you can use Docker containers for almost everything. You can even run databases such as Elastic in there. Um, you can use it for Kafka. And so this all works. It, it depends how whether, whether it that makes sense for you depends uh, on, on the actual use case. It's not the best for everything. I don't say this, but it can be done. So um, we have Docker containers, and they are there for isolation, and that we can have it in a box. Maybe this sounds familiar to you already. Why do we need Docker for this? But as I, I saw on the hands, you know this slide already probably. Um, Docker is way li more lightweighted than normal virtual machines. This is because of its file system, um, which allows to reuse resources. So in a normal virtual machine, we have this infrastructure layer and some operat operating system, then the hypervisor, which takes all the VMs, and then every VM needs to run its own guest OS. And these ones are quite big and um, take some time to load some memories. And Docker can has the ability to reuse the, um, the binaries which are used by multiple containers, and therefore it's much less uh, weight. Okay, so we want to get a Docker, or like a Caperinia. So what do we need to, to have it? Actually, we need to know how to create it. So um, we need a recipe for a Caperinia, and our recipe for, for Docker is the Docker file. The Docker file is used to, to create a blueprint. Um, and if we want now to, to start to make our Caperinia, or our Docker image, um, we first need to create this Docker file, and then we need to build it. And I also want to try tonight to show you everything of that um, live. Um, I really hope this all works pretty nice. Um, 
What you see over here is a Zeppelin notebook. Um, who of you knows Zeppelin notebooks? Has seen that? Okay, also like half of it. Um, it's quite similar to Jupiter, if you know this one. Um, th that's where it all started um, in the Python world. Um, so you just create different cells and you can run them. And um, the nice thing about Zeppelin in comparison to Jupyter is that you can um, use it for a lot of different languages and different things. Um, we have um, interpreter bindings. So we cannot only use um, Python, like this interpreter over here. I haven't enabled it. Um, we can also run shell scripts, markdown, and there's also even known Flink um, interpreter, which I don't use today, so I'm sorry, but um, you can use this stuff, and I have tried it, and actually it, it works. Um, it's difficult in a Docker environment, but more to this later. Um, so let's have a look how the Docker file looks like. Um, here's a Docker file, which, um, which creates a, s a Flink image. Um, and probably, as you know, Docker files, um, it's maybe not too difficult for you, but I want to quickly go over it. Um, the purple commands in the beginning, these are the native commands for Docker. Um, so the from command over here is the basic. Um, this is the starting point um, where our Docker file starts. So Docker files often um, append upon each other. So if I would like to create a minimal Docker file, I could start over here with something like Debian or Ubuntu or something. But as you can see, we use a high, higher level image. Um, so this one already has some um, Java runtime installed. It has uh, Scala in version 2.11, and which you can't see from over here, but maybe you recognize it if you see APK over here. Um, the Linux under hood is an Alpine Linux, uh, for those who don't know it yet. Um, it's not that famous in the, in the desktop Linux world, but um, it's quite popular among the, um, the Docker community because it's minimal Linux. It only uh, contains the really basic stuff, and therefore it's possible to make um, images really small and easy to handle and easy to load. Okay, so after having a starting point, um, we define a couple of environment variables, and um, we use two different kind of um, terms over here. We use the classical environment variable, and we use arguments. Arguments can be modified at build time, so this way you can create a more modular um, Docker file, which, um, yeah, wi which can be used for different versions of um, Hadoop or, or Flink, for example, over here. You just need to bump up this number. Then there's this big run plug over here, which does actually all the magic. And in the beginning, this might look a bit messy, and what, but what it actually does it is it just creates a curl, then it gets to Apache, downloads all the sources we need, um, does some string replacement, and finally cleans up the cache. Um, you might wonder why we do all this with backlines and um, yeah, such a big block. It's, it's, it's not that easy to develop because, I mean, this way I would need to run all the commands together. Why don't we just write run in, in front of every line? Um, you can do that for development, that's totally okay. But in the end, um, you want to have it in one block because Docker uses a file system which is called AUFS, which um, has different layers. So every layer is built upon each other. And um, this has a lot of advantages. One advantage, for example, is that by creating multiple layers, one by each command, we can parallelize download. So um, we can just download all the layers and in the end stack it together. That makes it faster. And even more important, um, since if, if we just append a command over here or we modify this command here, um, all the other commands before, they stay the same. There's nothing changing. So we can just reuse them. And also if we have another container, which um, another build file, which has the same start scripts. Um, Docker can reuse these layers and therefore make it easy um, and reduce the size. Okay, after installing Flink, um, we just add some files into the Docker container from our host and um, define what is the starting point of this image if we, if we create a container and um, yeah, more to this later. So we have a Docker file, now we need to build it. Um, that's quite easy, Docker build. Um, the tag over here defines the name of the image and I also added a no cache flag so that you can see how it is built. 
um, and that uh, step 8 is the one which takes kind of the most time. So this one is still running. And as soon as it is done, we will um, it will print out all the images we have so that we can check that it's really there. Um, that shouldn't take too long. Um, almost done. Um, I can already... Uh, step 13 of 13, here we are. So you can see if on the one hand <laughs> I have way too many Docker images installed. Second, um, the, the image we have is just over here, it's created, um, it's quite fresh. Okay, that wasn't too difficult, I hope. Um, but actually, sometimes I don't want to get a, if, if I want to drink a nice cocktail, I don't always want to go out and buy the ingredients, get the ice, cut the lemons and so. S maybe I'm lazy and I just want to have it. I, I don't want to care and take care of all the stuff. So what do I do? I just go to a bar. I just go there and order a drink and I have it. And there's also something similar in Docker. Um, we just use Docker pull, um, which is kind of similar to git pull. You probably know this. Um, so with Docker pull, I can just download a finished image of somebody else. And I'm doing this over here. So um, I'm just saying Docker pull and then an identifier which image. So the classical point, starting point is Docker hub, which is kind of like GitHub for Docker. Um, and there it's checking like my namespace and my container and then it's downloading it and it recognizes, okay, I already have all those layers because it's the same image. I just uploaded it before. Um, so um, it doesn't need to download anything. It's really fast. Okay. Um, now, um, we only have the images. We don't have an actual container. We, c we can't to run Flink with this yet. So we need to create the container. So we need to say docker run. And we do this um, by running this command over here. What it actually does is um, it maps, it, it runs detached. So in the background, um, it maps a couple of ports. Um, so this one means it maps the port 8081 on within the container on port 8082 on my host machine. Because by default, every Docker container has its own network. You can't um, access the data from the outside. Um, so um, that's why I need to open those ports. And I also define some starting point. I'm overwriting the entry script we, ha we had of the image. And I'm just starting it in a local Flink mode. This is kind of the default way if you want to start Flink. Um, go to the binary, start local, and um, yeah, here you are. So now we should be able to access the um, the UI of Flink on port 8082, and there we are. So we can see there's a task manager running, um, a slot available, um, yeah, and, and we can see all the the, the overview of Flink. Okay. Um, actually, I also want to want to to run some examples that that we can see that it actually works. Um, I I looked up whether where there's a nice example and I can really can recommend for you um the website of um the tutorial of data artisans um which you can find online. It's over here. I can quickly uh I haven't run this. Um I can quickly show it to you. It's quite nice. Um here you have a lot of um different tutorials for data streams RP, for um for the data data set RP. Um it provides you slides and hands-on training so this one is pretty pretty good as a starting point if you want to learn Flink. And that's the way I did it. Um, and from there, I, I just downloaded the source code. I built it with Maven. And um, so I can just submit a job. I'm, I'm uploading a file which I, I pre-built. I didn't do anything interesting there. I just downloaded the source and built it with Maven. I can upload it so that the people can see the how it works if they have never used Flink before. Um, I say I want to run this jar. Then I need to tell them, okay, what what is it what I want to use? So I want to use um, this class over here. And we also need to tell him um, on what data we want to run it. So what it actually does is... Um, it has some taxi data from New York, 
and um, it's ha it has geolocations of places where caps had been ordered and where the rights ended, and um, it processes them. Um, so we we see it's it's starting a job. Um, that's the name of it. We see it's running now for six seconds, and if we go over here to the to the job manager and go into the standard out, we can see first some configuration stuff. And after that, it depends um, the actual processing of the data. We see some geolocations that over here taxi ride started, and more down here. There should be also um, it's coming later, but later there are also coming scripts where where's an end of the of the scripts. Okay, great. So far so good. We we have a Docker container which is running a Flink command. That's great, and that's it. Eh? Um, actually. Why would we need Docker for this? Up to now, we, we just installed Flink somewhere and run it on a local mode and apply the job. There's nothing interesting there. So why do we need Docker? Actually, you can easily scale out. That's why, why you want to have Docker. And how do you do this? Um, if, if I wanted to recognize it, uh, I wanted to get to know it. So I went to the documentation of Flink, which is quite nice. And there you will see th that you need a task manager and some um, some workers, um, and you can see uh, where you configure it. So you define some address um, for the job manager, the IP address. Um, yeah. So we need two different types of 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 um, Docker containers, but actually we can use the same image for it. And if we would would want to create it in the pure Docker way, we need to run a lot of different Docker commands. We need to say Docker run, uh, map a couple of ports, basically the same we did before, just with different entry points over here and maybe exposing different kind of ports. Um, that's not nice. That's not the way we, we want to create a bigger cluster. That's pretty bad, actually. So there's a nicer way, which is native by Docker. It only runs local, but therefore it's really helpful. This is Docker Compose. Um, I guess from the hands you you most of you know it already. It has a nice easy YAML syntax which is easy to use. Um, it's quite s similar to the classical Docker CLI commands. You can reuse your knowledge. It provides you custom networking. So if you um, start up a lot of different um, containers in one Docker Compose file, it creates a network within them so they can e access each other, but not other containers from the outside. And the best of it, it's really easy to rerun. So if you have a complex setup of different Docker containers and so, you just create one Docker Compose file, put it next to the other files in your GitHub repository, and you say Docker um, Compose up, and then everything is started, the images are pulled or built, depending on the file. So it's really easy to, to rerun the full setup. Okay, how does the Docker Compose file look like? It's um, it's something like this. Um, so this one uses version two. Um, it defines a couple of services. That's what it's called in version two. Um, so we have two different types of services. We have a Flink job manager and a Flink task manager, both depending on the same image, offering some ports which are different because they are doing different stuff. Of course, the one is managing the full job, the other one is running the tasks. Um, and the most interesting part over here is that um, the Flink task manager depends on the job manager and it also links the job manager. By using link, um, some, f some people think it, it has something to do with networking, like, like with port mapping. Actually, it's more about find being able to access the other container by the name. So if I link the Flink job manager um, to the Flink task managers, I can access um, the Flink job manager using the name Flink job manager. That's basically wha what it does. Okay, let's try to run this one as, as well. Docker compose, we um, already saw the file, I don't need to do this. I say docker compose up minus D so that it's running detached in the background and I print out all my docker um, things we have over here. I see the, the docker image from th um, the container from the last and over here the three I just started. Um, and I can go to um, I can change the port now to 8081 and then there is another one with two different uh, no, with, with the task manager okay 
let's let's try to to increase that. We don't want to have just one task manager. One task manager is boring. Let's say we want to have four. So I just say Docker Compose scale, and what kind of instance, what kind of service I have defined in my Docker Compose file, I want to scale, and then Docker does all the rest. It's it's starting those task managers, it's checking them, and now we can go here and we see it's already updated. Um, so no re um, actually it, the, the UI is quite nice over here. It's automatically updating it. Okay, nice. Um, there we are. We have different containers running together. Um, some some Flink stuff. Oh, I want to see this presentation. Um, but there's still something missing. Um, kind of like in the picture. Any idea what's missing in this picture? Exactly. It's it's not a good idea to try to drink a caipirinha without a straw. That actually doesn't really work. Um, so you need something to consume it. You need some access point, something um, w which makes it easier to, to use it. And this in the Docker world um, are container management tools. And Docker Compose is kind of a small version of a container management tool. It already provides you some things like service discovery so that the different containers can talk to each other. It also gives you like a small version of monitoring so you can see in um, which which um, containers are running, but there's no cluster, so of course you can't check the cluster health. Um, it gives, uh, but a, a classical container management tool gives you way more. It gives you the possibilities to diff um, to configure what kind of resources um, should be used, um, what are the limits by these different resources. It automatically provisions the Docker containers to the right host, so it checks where are the resources I need available and how can I distribute them, and actually it also can do rolling updates and rollbacks. So this is something you really want to use if you run all this stuff in a production environment. Um, you don't want to take care of all this by yourself. Um, there are a lot of frameworks out there. Um, probably you n already know a couple of them. That's Docker Swarm. That's kind of the native implementation. Um, it's um, I only used it like half a year ago, or like no, even a year ago. So at that point, it was quite buggy. I've heard it's getting better, but this is kind of like the most native Docker version. Um, but it should be still difficult to to run it in production. I've heard. I haven't used it that much. Then there's like this framework which is based on Mesos, on the distributed kernel um, over here. And then there's Kubernetes. And Kubernetes is what we use over here. Kubernetes inspired by Google, um, older actually than, or kind of, yeah, the, the technique behind uh, Kubernetes is even older than Docker. Uh, Google has used the, the, the parent project of this in the data centers before um, even Docker existed. And Kubernetes has some kind of special own te terminology you probably need to know to, to use Kubernetes. So um, I want to give you an easy introduction to that one as well, using our, uh, our, our examples. So um, a Caipirinha or, or a container is similar to a pod, just for the beginning. Actually, if you're, in the if it, if you're a JavaScript developer, you recognize it's just two equals. It's not, it's not the same. Um, it's kind of the same. It's... Um, you you can actually put multiple containers in one pod, but for the beginning, let's assume it's 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 the same thing. Then we have a replication controller. This is kind of like the bartender. He looks that every um, pod is up to date, um, that there are as many cocktails on the on the table as there should be, um, and yeah, uh, he's he's managing um, the replication of the different uh, of the different containers. Then we have the service, the straw I mentioned. Um, this is the way to access the data from the outside, but also it's the way um, to connect different pods to each other. And finally, there is something like the bar itself, um, where you can put the stuff in there. It's the namespace um, where everything is living. So um, to run all this, we need some kind of infrastructure. And great for Kubernetes is the Google cluster. Actually, you can use Kubernetes kind of everywhere. Microsoft's offering a good solution. You can even um, install it on AWS, even if it's not that natively supported over there. Um, so what I already did before, because that takes like two, three minutes, is to um, set up a cluster. But actually, I just ran this command. So it just takes a couple of minutes. And so Zeppelin is killing the, the process over here. But what I did it was install it was um, yeah starting a cluster 
um, using my cluster password and version 152 of, of Kubernetes. So if we just run this command over here, we can see that the cluster is up running. I hope at least it's still up running. Um, yeah, still up running. We have three nodes there in the standard configuration and now we can start do something. So we need to access the credentials. Uh, Gcloud is providing us an easy and easy way to get the credentials. Um, and now I can create a namespace. So what I'm always doing over here is um, um, yeah, pasting out here the, the file itself. So you see everything it takes to create a namespace is quite easy. Um, you just define that it is a namespace, you give it a name and a label, so over the label you can access it, you could give it different kind of labels, and then we have something living um, in the namespace. Um, so a good overview to use all this kind of stuff is to run kube etctl proxy. This, is, um, this gives you access to um, to a dashboard from where you can see everything which is going on within Kubernetes. I'm starting this one in my own uh, in non terminal window because it's an ongoing process and it's running on localhost. Uh, I forgot it. 8001. You need a UI after this. This is quite important <laughs> in the beginning. Some people fall into this. Um, and then you, you get this overview. And you have some namespaces, and you see there are some default namespaces, and there's this Flink namespace we just created. Okay, um, let's keep on along to that you can e more easily follow. So we have this namespace, which is kind of our table. After creating a namespace, we want to create a replication controller, which then, by its own, is starting some pods. So we don't need to define um, each point individu individually, that's why we have replication controllers, that they take care of this kind of stuff for us. So, let's switch over here. Um, we want to create a replication controller. We are doing this. So, it's, it's the type, the kind is replication controller. Um, we only want to have one replica for it. We want to create it in the namespace Flink. And, um, then it has some specs, so this is the information about the actual container we want to use. Um, it has some, some ports we open up, it's quite similar to the stuff we actually did with Docker, so open up ports, define arguments, what to run. This is using another image um, from online, this is quite, quite nice actually. Um, actually that's the general great thing about Docker, um, you can just Google it and you will find a lot of Docker files and, and predefined images you can just build upon and you can use, um, which is quite helpful. Um, so we created this um, replication controller. Let's check whether it's there. Um, we go in the overview and go to replication controllers and see here's a replication controller and if we go to full workload, um, we can not just see the replication controller, so also the pod is uh, created actually. That's quite bad. Let's check why this is happening. Um, what are th so we, we, we can access it over here. We can get into the logs and we can check them and see why this is crashing. Yeah, I haven't seen that one yet. I'm sorry for this. Let's just assume that um, we, we want to create the other thing as well, that you get at least the overview. Um, so maybe it will recover by itself. Um, after creating a job manager, we also we, we first create the service. So the service is the way we can access this job manager from, from other containers or other pods. So um, it's basically quite similar. Um, we run... Um, some file which is also like um, YAML syntax which is opening some ports um, and it's giving a name to every port so this one is kind of like the RPC protocol Flink is using this one is here for file storage um, so that the, the containers can exchange files um, like jar files between each other um, also running in the same namespace 
Um, you will find this one in the overview over here under services and over here are some internal endpoints and this is kind of important. The endpoints provided by a service are only accessible from the inside. So the, the pods can access them but you can't access them from the outside. Um, either you need to proxy into it um, using SSH or some, some kind of proxy but um, or you use something different we will see in a second. Um, Let's switch to the overview. After creating a service, we will create another replication um, controller for the task manager, which thereby cr um, will start a couple of different pods. Um, so let's keep on doing this. We create um, the task manager controller. Um, it's quite similar to the other controller, but it has more replicas, so we want directly to have three of them. Um, and it's running the task manager instead of the job manager. Um, yeah, over here you can can define how many resources the, the the pod is allowed to get, and yeah, this one should be there as well. Yeah, we see it's just starting. The other one is already at five restarts, uh, but now it's running. Let's see. Um, Okay, finally, we want to have something to access all this information from the outside. So we create another service, and this service is, is also similar to what we have done before, but it has one major difference. So um, this one is using type load balancer. So type load balancer tells us that we want to access the service from the outside, and if we do this, um, Kubernetes will not just start the an, um, an internal service, for everything, it will also start an external endpoint. This is also why it takes a bit longer because it needs to check um, what what IP addresses um, do I have from the outside, and this IP address is static. So, um, as long as this server keeps on running, I can access this um, IP address. As soon as I kill the the service, um, of course it's gone, but I can kill the pods and the replication controllers and everything under the hood, and the service still stays the same. It will map to other upcoming pods um, and we'll keep the external endpoint. So let's refresh and check whether it's there. Ah, not yet. It shouldn't take too long. Um, yeah, and, and using the external endpoint we should be able to access the Flink GUI um, hopefully after not too many restarts of the job manager. Um, good question for, for any questions. I'm almost done. Um, uh, anybody already has something he wants to really ask? Okay, so I give you some more time and check whether the endpoint is there. Okay, let's see. Yeah, here we are. We already have. We also have three task managers. So actually, uh, the job manager recovered by itself, um, and we can do kind of the same stuff we did um, with Docker Compose. We can just say kubectl in stop of doc Docker and scale the number of replicas and it should be scaling now to more containers and yeah actually it's already five task managers it had been three right it had been three before no. okay so we we to to summarize this we we now have all this running in the cloud on hardware from google which we need to pay for but yeah um and um we can scale out what's up what could we do next? Um, actually, there are a lot of things you can do with it. You can use more interesting use cases than just um, providing taxi drives in New York. Um, you can apply different tools in this, so not just using Flink. You can use like anything else to, to get into a container and try to play around with that one. Um, so using different cocktails. and. Um, we can use even more automation. We can create a build pipeline, which is doing all the stuff so that we don't even need to run this full workbook. We can um, do something that is running automatically. That's what we're actually doing right now over here. Um, we are um, using GitLab and GitLab CI to automatically um, build Docker images, pr um, put them in a custom Docker registry, so not Docker Hub, but in a custom one, and then um, use Kubernetes to pull those Docker images um, and load it in pods so that we can just uh, provide kind of different big data technologies in the end 
um, the cloud easily. We're not done yet, we're on a long journey, but we have a couple of students sitting um, there in the back which are um, working on this and um, yeah, I can introduce you if you're interested in this. So um, thank you very much for the attention and um, I'm really happy to hear any questions. <laughs>